throughout World War II, Germany produced some of the most technologically stunning weapons ever seen. But was this obsession with technological wonder actually a fatal flaw? These are six of the war's most over-engineered German weapons. The Henschel Scheiss 293 was a technologically novel radio-controlled German anti-ship glide bomb whose strategic utility was fatally undermined by severe operational and mechanical flaws. Its core weakness was the reliance on the Kill Strasbourg Manual Command to Line of Sight radio link. This system mandated that a single human operator maintain continuous visual contact with the missile and target, controlling the weapon via a joystick. This requirement limited attacks to daylight and good visibility and forced the launch aircraft to fly straight and level, making it highly vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire and fighters. Crucially, the low VHF band radio link was highly susceptible to allied electronic countermeasures, or jammers, like the Type 650, which rapidly nullified the missile's precision advantage in contested areas. Mechanically, the design was complex, integrating a 500-kilogram bomb with wings, control surfaces, a radio receiver, and a Walter liquid propellant rocket motor for initial boost. The volatile propellants and delicate electronic components increased handling hazards and maintenance difficulty for both air and ground crews, demanding specialized test equipment and protocols. This complexity, combined with the high cost of the electronic guidance, made the weapon logistically burdensome and failure-prone. Ultimately, the HS-293's rigid operational constraints, specialized crew training, and rapid neutralization by Allied jamming rendered it an inefficient and non-scalable alternative to simpler conventional torpedo and dive bomber attacks. The Type 21 Electro Boat was a technologically advanced U-boat and finalized in 1943, whose impact on the Battle of the Atlantic was negated by excessive design complexity, logistical failures, and production delays. The boat's highly streamlined hull and cutting-edge electric propulsion system featured powerful main motors and dedicated silent running engines. These required precision engineering and a battery capacity three times that of its predecessors. Novel features like the intricate hydraulic torpedo reloading system and the complex snorkel further increased internal and mechanical complexity. This made the submarine very delicate and maintenance intensive. Despite adopting prefabricated sectional construction to speed up production, the inherent complexity and poor subcontractor quality led to sections exceeding tolerances. This, coupled with Allied bombing and severe shortages of specialized parts, drastically slowed commissioning. Planned for a six-month build, many Type 21 submarines took 18 months to build or more. The boat's reliance on huge batteries and complex hydraulics made maintenance and repair difficult, demanding specialized workshops and prolonging turnaround times. Furthermore, the new systems required intensive crew retraining for submerged operations and battery management. Of 381 boats planned, only 119 were commissioned, and only one was fully combat ready before the war's end. The immense resource expenditure on the Type 21 yielded a strategically meaningless result compared to continued production of simpler, readily available Type 7 U-boats. The RO-234 Blitzjet combined high-speed capability with extreme logistical and mechanical complexity, which significantly limited its strategic impact. Initial A-series prototypes featured an excessively complicated non-retractable skid landing system and the jettisonable three-wheel trolley for takeoff. This design created a massive logistical bottleneck as the trolley had to be recovered and reattached by ground crews after every landing. It prevented the aircraft from taxiing and increasing airfield exposure and turnaround time. This flawed system was eventually replaced by a fully retractable wheeled undercarriage in the production B-series. The use of twin Junkers JU004 jet engines was a major drawback. Due to the scarcity of high-grade alloys, the engines were built with materials that drastically reduced their operational lifespan to only 10 to 25 flight hours. This short service life created an enormous demand for constant replacement, resulting in high spare part consumption. Engine overhauls were constant maintenance and resource burden that grounded many airframes. Pilots required specialized conversion training to manage the jet engine's sensitive throttle response and the aircraft's advanced systems, including a pressurized cabin on some variants. The AR-234 was a logistically unsustainable choice compared to simpler, more reliable piston-engine alternatives like the UJ-8. 
The V-2 rocket was a groundbreaking ballistic missile whose technological complexity rendered it an immensely costly and strategically inefficient terror weapon. The design was inherently complex, relying on a liquid-fueled engine burning 75% ethanol and highly reactive liquid oxygen. Propellant was forced into the combustion chamber by a delicate high-speed turbopump assembly powered by corrosive hydrogen peroxide. Furthermore, its primitive electromechanical guidance system utilized sensitive gyroscopes and an analog computer called Mishkaret for stability. This complexity meant the V-2 was logistically ruinous. The unit cost was estimated at 100,000 Reichsmarks, and the program diverted vast numbers of skilled engineers, scientists, and critical materials, including approximately one-third of Germany's fuel alcohol production. Initial assembly required up to 20,000 man-hours per rocket, demanding extensive infrastructure investment. The volatile liquid oxygen and complex turbopump systems demanded specialized technicians, immaculate cleanliness, and rigorous pre-launch checks, making the missile extremely difficult to maintain and operate safely in field conditions. Fueling had to occur close to launch time due to liquid oxygen's cryogenic nature. The V-2's extreme velocity and high-altitude trajectory were overbuilt for simply delivering its one-ton conventional warhead, resulting in a low warhead-to-launch weight ratio as well as poor accuracy. As an indiscriminate terror weapon, the V-2 failed to affect the strategic outcome of the war, yet its production consumed resources that could have funded thousands of defensively effective fighter aircraft or the much simpler V-1 flying bomb. The Tiger II or King Tiger was probably the most well-known example of German over-engineering, which resulted in a formidable but logistically unmanageable tank. Weighing 70 tons, its immense size and complexity were its downfall. The intricate OVAR gearboxes, hydraulically-assisted steering, and interleaf suspension were technologically advanced but were extreme precision and were prone to catastrophic failure. Final drives were overstressed by the weight and frequently failed during sharp maneuvers or hard driving. The complex interleaves road wheels increased maintenance man hours and could immobilize the suspension in mud or ice. At 321,500 Reichsmarks, the cost was staggering, making it the most expensive German tank of World War II. Specialized casting and welding for its immense, thick armor plates and large turret consumed huge amounts of high-quality steel, severely limiting production to only 492 units. Maintenance was a disaster, due to extreme weight, scarce recovery vehicles, and slow, labor-intensive removal of multiple interleaved road wheels. Consequently, field crews often abandoned mechanically failed tanks. The sophisticated controls also demanded highly specialized driver training to avoid transmission damaging shocks. The resources consumed by one Tiger II could have produced two to three Panther tanks, a simpler, more mobile design with sufficient firepower to confront typical Allied tanks. The King Tiger's low operational readiness and strategic cost made it an inefficient weapon for Germany's late war needs. The Swiever Gustav and Dora 800mm railway guns represented the pinnacle of overbuilt engineering in World War II. It was monumental in scale but negligible in tactical value. Built by Krupp, each gun weighed about 1,350 tons and measured over 47 meters long, with 32.5 meter barrel mounted on twin railway tracks. They could not traverse freely and required semicircular rails for limited aiming. Each component, including breech, hoists, and carriages, needed precision forging, reinforced tracks, and massive cranes for assembly. The complexity and weight demanded unprecedented mechanical precision, while recoil stresses necessitated reinforced embankments and counter-recoil systems. Production was extremely costly, with each gun costing 7 million Reichsmarks, which consumed steel and labor sufficient for making dozens of tanks or hundreds of anti-tank guns. Only two massive railway guns were built, which tied up vast industrial capacity. Assembly required 25 railway cars spanning 1.5 kilometers and weeks of construction at each site. At Sevastopol, deployment took over a month and 4,000 men, including two flak battalions for protection. Even after setup, the gun fired only one round every 45 minutes, with barrel wear demanding relining after limited shots. Its enormous 7-ton shells had a range of 47 kilometers, but results rarely justified the effort. Only 48 rounds were fired in combat. The gun's immobility, slow rate of fire, and vulnerability to air attack made it insuitable for mobile warfare. Simpler, cheaper alternatives like a few battalions of Hummel's self-propelled artillery could achieve better results due to rapid rate of fire. 
Ultimately, Swever Gustav stood as a propaganda symbol of excess engineering, a colossal weapon that drained resources while providing little strategic return. Thank you for watching and see you in our next videos.